You are now listening to Thoroughly Spoiled, the podcast where software developers critique creative writing. On today's episode, we discuss Daybreak, a Netflix original set in a world where adults have turned into zombies and kids are left to fend for themselves. We go through its plot, discuss what we liked and what we didn't, and finish off by suggesting improvements to its rather flimsy character arcs. So, unless you've already seen the series, consider this a warning. Sit back, relax, and prepare to be thoroughly spoiled. Okay, I'll do the beat. I'll do the melody, crystal lyrics. What? Oh. <laughs> Three guys sitting in a corner, <laughs> wanting <laughs> to review films <laughs> and series, because series are bad. Yeah. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Netflix series is trash. The work in progress title for the latest up and coming podcast featuring Christopher Min. Hello, I'm a guest. Holly Hoffman. Hello, I'm not a guest. No, you're one of the hosts of the show. Well, hopefully. Yes, and me, Harvey, HSC Gaming. Yeah, we, this is this is the start of a a new series that, as of right now, is sort of a bit of a working format. Uh, it's not quite nailed down yet. Uh, but for right now, we're going to be talking about um, some shows on Netflix and Amazon Prime or, or whatever else we want. Um, whatever streaming services we happen to have a subscription to. Oh, this is your tea. That Sorry. is my tea. Yep, There's some tea tomfoolery <laughs> happening here. Yeah? There's already some conflict that starting. Was a, that was a power move. Taking another man's tea is... is, yeah. is uh, <laughs> originally, originally the show was going to be about terrible Netflix shows, but um, since we both actually quite like this show, we'd be breaking the rules before we even started. Yeah, let's just jump into it. So, Daybreak is a somewhat generic zombie apocalypse series. Horridy comma, I think. Horridy horror. Horridy comma. Cut this bit out. Uh, horror comedy, I think, is the uh, is the title on Wikipedia. Is the description horror the show, comedy? I, I, I would rearrange that and say comedy horror. Oh, the the asterisks are definitely around the comedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's um, far more comedy than it is horror. Yeah, all the adults have been turned into zombies or ghoulies that they call them, and all the kids have maintained their social groups from high school yeah. and have split off into different gangs. So you've got you've got the jocks, you've got the geeks, right. you've got. The young farmers groups and the gamers, they're all split off into different areas and they've kind of taken up home in different areas of the city. And they've, they've kind of fortified the area of the city and that's... So you, you have the, like the jock district and the uh, the cheerleader district and okay. all that kind of thing. So Chris hasn't seen or even before today heard of this series. In fact, before today, he didn't even know the name of the show we're going to be uh, talking about today. In fact, before... Very recently, he didn't even know he was going to be on a show. <laughs> no, this is, this is yeah, this is a surprise surprise appearance. But Ollie, Ollie, you told me to watch this because I did. Yeah, this show is something that I've wanted to see for a while. There's been similar kind of runs of it. I remember some there was a community episode with a kind of similar vibe to it. Um, but this this is a show that I've wanted to see for a while, and I've had a lot of ideas for myself, but which I've never actually seen done before. Mm. And I feel like this kind of just missed the mark on on the possibilities that could have been there for this genre. The main series it reminds me of is uh, Charlie Hickson's The Enemy. I think was The Enemy was the first book in his... I've not actually seen that. It's a, not a series of novels, and um, it's much darker. It's mm. like the horror comedy without the comedy. It's, yeah. Horror. Definitely. <laughs> All the adults get turned into zombies. Real cannibalistic mm. type. So before we get into it... Let's talk about some of the uh, the more uh, broader things about it. What do we think we got on IMDb, Harvey? Oh, am I supposed to guess the percentage? Yeah, guess the percentage. I would say pretty mediocre. I think probably 67. 68? Hey! Wow, wow. <laughs> very close. Which, as Netflix shows go, is probably pretty good for the average. Um, are most Netflix shows really bad? I think a lot of them are. There's some real standout ones and some quite a lot of really bad ones. Especially their earlier attempts at original productions mm. before their budgets mm. were mm. significant. Yeah. The show follows main character Josh, who is kind of like a uh, he was he was the new guy at school, I think, before the bomb fell. Yeah. And he was a bit of a loner. I didn't really have a group that he belonged to. Uh, and now in the apocalypse, he's just a wanderer. He wanders around, does his own thing, moves kind of from safe house to safe house to safe house. 
and collects food up. Lone wanderer searching for his true love, and that's kind of all you know. Yeah. The very start. I don't yeah. Know. Um, a, a few questions at the start, and after a little while of wandering around, he discovers a church with uh, some some of the jocks in it, and the jocks are kind of portrayed as the bad guys in the show, as as they so often are in these kind of like uh, yeah, com- like high school kind of shows. Oh, the jocks are always the bad guys. Um, and he hears screaming inside, screaming that he thinks is his girlfriend, Sam. He's on the verge of, of just leaving this church because, oh man, the jocks are yeah. already here. Monologuing to the camera is, is something, they, they, that is a thing that co- happens from the very start where they break the fourth wall. Okay. Um, kind of Markham in the middle-esque. Mm. So they, the main character turns to the camera and says something or or there's like a, I think it's more of like a homage to the graphic novel style. Okay. Uh, where they communicate directly to the reader. After that, he rescues the girl, and it turns out not to be his girlfriend, Sam. It's... What Angelica. It? Angelica, like a, a, who's essentially the character from Borderlands 2. Um, do you remember her name? Oh, God. You play Borderlands 2. <sighs> sort of. So Very the little good, fire first. girl who like sets everything on fire and is crazy... Is it like Trixie Mixie or something, something like that? Like, uh, it's something called? cartoony. Tiny Tina. Tiny Tina. She's essentially the Tiny Tina of the show. She's 10 years old. She's a tensor. Is it Mensa or tensor? She's a genius. Yeah. Yeah. Mensa. Mensa, Mensa yeah. level yeah. whatever. Uh, homeschooled in theoretical quantum physics and morality. Yeah. And, yeah. and her parents were always strict because they wanted her to be the best she could be. And so... They never showed her any affection or love. Yeah. Right. And she grew up with this terrible mother complex. She's a... Uh, the, the Japanese anime fans would call her Tsundere. She's always pretending she doesn't want affection when she really does. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, that kind of archetype. Uh, and, so sexy. And then they walk outside of the church and get stopped by a street samurai. <sighs> A samurai. A samurai, okay. Like an actual samurai. An actual samurai. Yeah, okay. His name is Wesley. And honestly, Wesley is one of my favourite characters in the show. Mine too. He's he's a very... His story's a bit weird, but he's actually very well done and he's good acting. Uh, I think the reason I like him is because Josh and Angelica are both very archetypal. Mm. Like, especially Angelica. She's the genius kid. Mm. Wesley is a jock who kind of doesn't really want to be a jock anymore. He was a total bully during Mm. high school. But he was... Not only was he a bully, he was also, like, obsessed with... Samurai, yeah. uh, katanas, and anime. He's like probably. a jock weeaboo, basically. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So he actually had. I mean, that in itself doesn't sound too unique, but it's better than most yeah. jocks it lets in those you shows. People hmm. associate with them more. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. like he was, you know, decently, he could put together a sentence pretty well, you know. And he's probably, of the three, probably the best actor of them all. So Wesley was originally running with the jocks, who were this most powerful gang. And then something happened. He did something bad. And now he wants to repent. Mm. So he's following the Bushido code to be like a pacifist samurai and to repent for his sins. And that's essentially Wesley's storyline through the whole show, is he's trying to repent for the sins. And we don't know what his sins are. Um, So 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 he's kind of a mysterious... Yeah. The mysterious stranger who just... Yeah, Kurt started tagging along. Yeah, and I guess I guess we can start by focusing on him actually because there's some very kind of basic story writing stuff where it's like you have a character, the audience doesn't know everything about the character. He's got a big secret, mm-hmm. so naturally, like, wow, mm-hmm. finding out his secret has to be an interesting journey, which they don't do. No, it 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 really is does not. It falls very flat, okay. especially the big reveal at the end with his storyline. It's essentially he has a secret the entire time. Yeah, and then they tell you what a secret is, and it's not that big of a deal. And okay. it almost has zero repercussions. <laughs> it's supposed to be something really, really terrible. Right. But day to day activities that the other kids do are more terrible. Yes, definitely. <laughs> okay, right. yeah. So it's so, kind of like the Marvel Cinematic Universe getting bigger and bigger threats. Yeah. Mm. And making small threats seem meaningless. It's like his yeah. small personal thing is so ridiculously small. <laughs> Do you think maybe that could have been like an intentional thing? Like for no, the audience no. to react and say, oh. No, it was set up as if it was supposed to be something really deep and meaningful. Yeah. And then when they revealed it, they revealed it like they just placed it on the table and went, there you go, that's Mm -hmm. it. Yeah, so after they meet Wesley, there's a character who kind of 
is ominous in the background. He's just always around this guy called Baron Triumph. Baron Triumph. And Baron Triumph has the potential to be one of the most interesting characters in the whole show. So, so mm. far, we've kind of focused on these kids. Yeah. Mm. And they're just surviving, right? The reason they're having to survive is because all the adults have been turned into zombies, which they call mm-hmm. ghoulies. Now, ghoulies aren't infectious. There's no contagion. No. Nope. If they bite you, you're not going to turn into one. Okay. They will just eat you. Yes. The whole deal is that they're mindless and they just really want to eat humans. Um, which we'll go into... I'll mention that later again yeah. because that's okay. actually pretty good. And there's a nice kind of comedy just touch to them, which is that they constantly repeat the last thing they said before they became a ghoulie. <laughs> yeah. Which is just like whatever mindless, stupid adult yeah. thought was going through their brain. <laughs> it's like, I need to buy sweatpants. <laughs> so they walk down the street saying that all their lives. Yeah, forever now. I've heard they have a two-for-one sale at the local supermarket. <laughs> I ought to order that Xbox 360 for my son. <laughs> you know, like, that kind of thing, yeah. Right. Which, which actually works all right. It's, it, yeah. it, it makes some good comedy moments. Yeah. yeah. And one of the most important things about the show is... There's something going on with the ghoulies. They're not just zombies. Mm -hmm. There's more to their condition. So, there's this one adult who is riding around on a motorbike, dressed up in leather, (laughs) face covered in a mask and a gas mask, and he goes around capturing kids in his cage and taking them back to his evil lair, and those kids are never seen again. Mm Mm-hmm. So, villain. We have a villain. A, a potentially very good villain, like like I said before, because that is true mystery. Like, you don't understand why this guy's alive. Mm-hmm. You don't understand why he's still functional enough that he can ride a motorbike and capture yeah. kids and stuff when all the rest are zombies. And he's fairly obviously mm. an adult, I think just from, like, body build. Yeah, yeah. And everyone has a theory, all the in-game, all the, in-game, <laughs> all the characters in the show have a theory on who it is. Right. And it's essentially this one particularly awful bully from the school mm. who was held back several years. Oh, okay, so he's like a And so he's, he was 18 or yeah. something when the rest of them were 16, are they? Something like that, yeah. yeah. What's good about that is that there's a very natural route to accepting that it's probably this guy. Yeah. Which is that he's like just 18, and so whatever mystical force means that kids have it, but or kids don't have it, but adults do, you might imagine that, oh, he's turning into an adult. Uh, and so when it happened, yeah. he yep. was like half an adult, half a kid. So he's like, has maybe the cannibalistic ter- uh, tendencies, but still retains more brain functioning. I mean, it's it's not like it's an original idea, mm. but there's something ominous there. Yeah. yeah. So it's it could yes, have been definitely. really good. Like, there's and potential. I, I will say, just before we go further, Baron Tri- there's two characters in the show who really were sold short, who had the potential to be very, very good and ended up being very, very bad. Uh, well, not very, very bad, but bad. Mediocre. Um, I would yeah. say mediocre. Me- mediocre, yeah. yeah. Just boring. And Baron Triumph is one of them. The other main villain is the leader of the jocks. The jocks are the biggest gang. They control several of the other gangs. I think they kind of yeah, absorb other gangs into them. Yeah. It's very Mad Max. Okay. Yeah, and they are styled after yeah. Mad Max. So they yeah. have all crazy haircuts and like, <laughs> and they all drive around in like motorbikes and yeah. jeeps and stuff. And they've got spikes sticking out of everything yeah. that they've like super glued on. Or Standard kind of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> improvised weapons. Like mm. the the first jock team you meet at the golf is the golf club. Mm. Which become a recurring joke as well. That I quite yeah. like every every other, every other episode. I think one of them dies. So yeah, it's like they've been cursed, mm. and like every time they get in fewer and fewer members. Yeah, it gets down to like two so of them, what? and they start advertising for new members. <laughs> <laughs> and because they play golf, which isn't a real sport, mm. like they get made fun of by all the other jobs. Oh, so yeah, no so one wants to join. The leader is this guy called Turbo, and Turbo is. Oh, I mean, what. His backstory is that he his dad like never praised him or something. He's a dandy boy, rich kid, yeah, all privilege, no substance, mm. winner of every athletic competition you could name. Yeah. Mm. Um, not very bright, but good at sports. Yeah. Rich dad who's got the most idealistic background mm. possible for a dad. He's like. He saves kids in Africa on the daily, That's and he's, it, yeah. he's associated with the UN, and he's organising yeah, all these... travels the world, rescuing yeah. orphans, and that kind of thing. And, like, every minute of his time that's spent at home, another child dies that he could have right, saved, okay. and so he's never at home. Yeah. 
Yeah. So never Turbo gets... never gets his approval, and that's his essential backstory before so the bomb yeah. so Turbo... That mm. trope is quite common. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's not. That's a good point, actually. It also came off as quite generic, mm. okay. yeah. which is a word yeah. I've been saying I mean, it's, a lot, it's, and I will continue to say. Yes, it is, That is incredibly generic. Um, yeah. Turbo, in the apocalypse, has, has gone totally insane. He's... He just goes around murdering people, and like he puts on crazy, t- uh, puts on crazy like stage plays where people die in the stage plays, and people fall into which pits is and stuff. one of the most interesting things yeah. that could have been great but was bad. So yes. we'll, we'll definitely go into that. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of crazy stuff which they do to each other. For instance, they have if any kid does something they don't like, they put them on stage on top of a trapdoor and have them entertain the rest of the jocks. Yeah. And then Turbo gives his Julius Caesar thumbs oh, up, okay. thumbs down. And if he doesn't like them, then they get dropped into a cage full of ghoulies mm-hmm. and get right. torn apart and eaten alive. Yeah, and those scenes are actually really good. I like how they do the jocks, because it's kind of Lord of the Flies, mm. where they're all in like a bloodlust, they're yeah. all kind of into it, but at the same time they're like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's kind of like, they've kind of been so far warped away from reality yeah. that they're all bit... The kind of last time you see that happen is like one of the last surviving members of the golf team. Yeah. I think he's number two. Yeah. And he goes up there because they think he betrayed Turbo. Oh, we shouldn't spoil it. We, should we talk, shouldn't spoil that. We'll talk about it But later. the point yeah. is that on when he's up there on the stage... Mm. He gives a beautiful performance. Mm. Like he's playing piano and he's singing and it's oh, amazing. Actually, that's all right. And like, everyone yeah. is like waving in the audience. Mm. And like, <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. I think they just kill him, don't they? Yeah, they just kill him, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it doesn't matter how well you perform. Right, he's still kind of, yeah. Just, yeah. So the overview is basically there's the three main characters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's the big bad uh, who is Baron Triumph, who's the kind of mysterious outsider who no one knows about. Then there's the jocks who are led by Turbo. Yeah. yeah. And that that's the kind of setup of the world. Um, okay. So at the end of episode two, or is it three, they end up at the mall where people believe that Baron Triumph lives. They're trying to get into the mall, but the doors are all locked. And in a very kind of meta climactic moment where the show turns to the camera and says, hey, isn't this climactic? <laughs> Baron Triumph rolls up. And then he removes its, his helmet, and it's just a kid. And Sup, nerds! Oh my God. <laughs> and introduce one of my least favorite characters in the show, Eli. Eli. Eli Kardashian, I think he's called. His second name is literally Kardashian. Okay. And he's got that entitled mm. sense to him. Right. Yeah. Uh, he is thrift store expert who has been dressing up like Baron Triumph. To scare people away from the mall so he can stay there himself. I quite liked him in the end. I, he definitely grew on me. Definitely grew, he grew on me. Yeah. He grew on me. Mm. Yeah. So he owns them all. They get in. So he betrays them and he traps them in there with a witch. And oh. the witch. She gets all the dramatic introduction. Yeah. <laughs> in the background. Yeah. You hear it echoing around them all. And then, uh, I don't remember exactly how they do their reveal, but essentially, oh my God, it's another adult. Yeah. It's a ghoulie. It's a zombie. She's yes. going to try and eat you. And then you realise that she's got more mental mm-hmm. functioning yeah. than a regular ghoulie. And she's, she's not human. That's just, but she's, she's not the same like mental ability as a human. She's kind of still a bit crazy and still a bit obsessed with eating people. Mm. But, but she still has some control over it. Right. Um, she is Miss Crumble. Mrs. Crumble. Yeah. Uh, who was a teacher at their school, obviously. Yeah. She realises that she's craving iron. Yeah, this and this. that seems to very loosely be the reason why the ghoulies want to eat people is for the blood, yeah, the iron blood. in their blood. Yeah, and so what she's been doing is like eating just stuff in the mall that has iron that has iron in it. <laughs> okay, and so she's like trying to satisfy her cravings without actually eating anyone, yeah. and it actually works quite well. Like it's quite a good a little little hint they give that they don't go too much into, but a lot of the stuff later on in the show plays on that of, yeah. of ghoulies trying to eat iron, and they do. The reason mm. it's good is because they don't explicitly say it again. Yeah. So yeah. they say it once, and then like five episodes later, you see a bunch of ghoulies attack a speaker and break it apart and eat the bits inside. Right. Yeah. Okay, so but they don't go like, huh, that was because <laughs> yeah. they were eating iron. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. they just ignore it, mm. which is good. Um, Very good. Yeah. That's good writing. Mm. Angelica, who is this 10-year-old genius, is like, oh my God, an adult who isn't fully like a ghoulie? This this is really important. We need to study her. 
We need to be all scientific on her. We need to watch what she does, figure out why she's different from the rest, and maybe that will lead mm-hmm. to a cure for everyone, and we can save the world. Um, also, the way they, they kind of try to introduce her to having had a relationship with Josh and the rest of the characters before is that, I think, what was it? She was, like, selling drugs in the school? Because she had so many kind of dysfunctional issues, she mm-hmm. went to a therapist and, like, played up her symptoms and pretended to have hallucinations, panic mm. attacks, in order to get medication prescribed. Oh. And then she would grind up the medication into, like, <laughs> essentially slime. candy. Yeah. Oh the God. slime thing was weird. That was very weird. I don't know oh. whether it was actually a craze in America at one point, but yeah. it doesn't matter. And basically, she'd sell that at the high school, which is the reason that she knows all these people from high school. Uh, That's the kind of convoluted way that they've introduced her to all the characters in, in right, the show. So she's, she she's was their drug lord person. kingpin. Yeah. Queenpin. Yeah, which yeah, it it doesn't go very well. It's not it's not a great storyline. Yeah, um. my one of the big issues with this whole show then mm. is probably just Angelica. Even though I actually kind of like her character, mm. I like what they tried to do with her, mm. but it undermines a lot of the rest of the show because she is so unrealistic. Yes, mm. I totally agree. I t- Angelica is one of my biggest problems with the show. She's um. a person who could not exist. Yeah, is the rest of them technically could. Different- yeah. She's so weird. She's a tensai genius mm. 10-year-old who sells drugs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but let's talk about Baron Triumph, because that's the main kind of interesting... Yeah. So, Him and Turbo, I'd say. Yeah, I think those are our two biggest complaints with the show. Uh, so Baron Triumph, essentially, is this... this, And one of the things I did... Com- uh, I, I wrote down in my notes before coming here was they didn't make him scary enough. And I know it's a comedy horror, but there was a lot of potential there to make him actually very scary. Like he's this kid, this guy who uh, who takes kids, and uh, we don't know what happens to them, and and, and all this stuff. Um, the funny thing is, there's a direct comparison to a character in Charlie Hickson's The Enemy, which is the series of books, which is the same premise but entirely horror. Mm. I think he's called the Toy Maker. Right. He, in his mind, he thinks he's like repairing toys. He's actually tearing apart children and stitching them together and stuff. And I think he eats them as well. Like, right. messed up. Good, good Baron Triumph, you don't see any of that kind of like, wow, that's fucked up. You yeah. see none of that. Yeah. Which they could have gone into and would have made him actually feel like a threat. Instead, yeah. his presence is just kind of there and a little bit confusing at times. And there's one scene I remember clearly where... It, he gets really undermined from his scariness and it's the one in the mall when they open up the freight lift. Yeah. And I feel like that scene it does the most damage to Baron Triumph out of all of It them. does. So uh, the witch is essentially on their side. Yeah. Uh, Angelica, Josh, Wesley, Eli, they're all in the mall and oh no, Baron Triumph is coming for them. There's no way he could get into the mall. Oh wait, I forgot about this entrance. Yeah. He comes up through the elevator and he steps out and you, like, I think there's some pathetic attempts to attack yeah. him, which he easily repels. And then Mrs. Crumble speaks in Spanish at him. Yeah. And he runs away. <laughs> right. <laughs> because he was scared. <laughs> okay. But, yeah, that it undermines his scariness yeah. a lot, that one scene. And they explain it away later. Hmm. When, you, when you do find out who he actually was, he mentions it. Yeah. And he's like, oh, I was just... What does he say? Like I was shocked to see her. I was surprised to see her. Yeah. I thought she would be dead. Yeah. Oh. Like the rest of all the zombies. And that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the explanation mm. for From then on, Baron Triumph isn't this scary, mysterious, mysterious monolithic character. Yeah. Mm. He's just some guy on a motorcycle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Josh gets taken and he ends up in a the old cereal factory, which the person that Josh thinks is Baron Triumph his family used to own. Okay. Which helps mm. propel the idea that, oh, it is definitely Hoyles, Hoyles yeah. who is Baron Triumph. Yeah. So essentially, he goes into this, uh, this this cereal factory and there's all these cages full of kids. Each student is a different nationality. Yeah. They're all foreign exchange students. <laughs> so none of them supposedly can communicate with each other. Yeah. Which is clever. Yeah, it, it works quite well, yeah. actually. Yeah. Eventually, Josh fumbles with his lockpick to try and get out, drops it, but one of the... Students is nearby, and rather than ratting on him, she helps him out. Mm -hmm. He runs out to find the keys to all the cages and finds Hoyles tied up on a conveyor belt above a fire. You know, classic 
pork pig mm. style apple in his mouth yeah. legs and hands tied behind his back so he's he's completely naked yeah he's clearly being prepared for food so it's not Hoyles so who is it and then he turns around and the big reveal is that the principal of the school, dun, dun, dun. who is, we haven't mentioned him to you yet, mm. but he's, I think, constant, there's constant flashbacks, obviously, to when they were all in school together. Yeah. And the principal's in every single one. Yeah. So he's a character you're familiar with at this point. Mm-hmm. And he's kind of nerdy. Uh, he's trying to be cool. Hello, fellow kids. That yeah, kind that, of. he is that kind of kid there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, great actor, though. Like, really good actor. Yeah, I thought it, he was solid, yeah. Um, but yes, it was him all along, that kind of pathetic principal. He is now killing kids. Yep. What would you say about his reveal? I, I think the biggest problem with his reveal was that it was too early. I think if they, I don't know if they're planning on making a second season or not, but I feel like this would be more second season material or the end of season one material, not episode four. Um, I know they, they wanted to make him a more like front and center character. Mm. They wanted to make the actor more main character and I think it just undersold the kind of threat in the world yeah um, what they do with it is pretty good so to kind of skip through it fairly quickly oh my god it was the principal the entire time Josh saves Hoyles fights him off they trap him and encage him and he's left in a cage for a while so he can't eat any more children and then eventually you realise that or the kids realise that they're just disintegrating. They've got no good leader. Yeah. And so one of them has the bright idea that we need an adult to take care of us and to organise us. We need some sort of authoritative figure that everyone will respect. They go back to him in his cage. Hey, do you promise you're not going to eat anyone if we let you out? (laughs) Sure. (laughs) I promise I won't eat anyone. (laughs) And so, great, please be the principal of our school again. And things return to this pseudo normality where they're he's the principal school of the again. school, <laughs> and they basically rebuilt the school in the apocalypse. Right, okay. which it, it's okay. There's some scenes in it that are all right, um, but there, there's some big problems with yeah. it. Um, but but before we get there, we need to, I guess we need to talk about Turbo because right. so show for the principal for now. Yeah, we'll come back to him. But so the reason mm-hmm. the kids suddenly need an authority figure that everyone respects <laughs> is because Turbo was that guy for the jocks. And then Turbo has his downfall. One thing that happens, the nerd sub-gang try to assassinate him. We're not going to take this tyranny any longer. Right. They're like okay, fumbling so they... behind their backs. And like there's this cool kind of scene where they have all these different bits and bobs that they assemble into a gun behind their yeah. backs. Good scene. They pass mm-hmm. it forward to the guy in front who whips it out and shoots Turbo. And Turbo uh, falls and dies. Mm. And so the nerds kind of step forward and proclaim themselves as the new leaders. <laughs> okay. And like, everyone kneel! Everyone's silent. Kneel! And so they all kind of get down. Yep. And then Turbo strolls in. He was using a body double. Oh, God. Yeah. Which is a little bit. It's, yeah. I think it's one of the golf guys, isn't it? It's one of the golf guys. Yeah, yeah. That was number three, I think. Four, uh, yeah. maybe. <laughs> um, mm. Yeah, Turbo's still alive. And so the nerds get subdued and the nerd leader Mm. gets taken away. What happens next is a really good illustration of how Twisted Turbo might be. And and this is one of the best scenes in the whole show. Yeah, There's a stage. It's complete darkness. Turbo is there dressed up in his jock school uniform. Yeah. And the nerd guy gets kind of prodded in. And he looks and there's a girl there holding cards. And it's like... Hi, son. How was school today? (laughs) And so the nerd is like, you want me to pretend to be your dad? And just say the lines, say the lines. I'm so proud of you, my son. And it goes on like that. It forces Uh, him to do a role play. With... With... With Turbo. With Turbo. Yeah. Who is, at this point, like, I think this is the first time we see him looking vulnerable. Yeah. He's, like, curled up and he's, like, kind of maybe half crying. Yeah. Uh, At one point, they end up embracing. Because I think this nerd guy is a little bit put off by how pathetic this is. (laughs) But at the same time, he kind of consoles him and embraces Mm. him. And he says, you know, you're you're all right. You're okay. And so you think like, oh my God, Turbo's getting this Mm. surrogate for this fatherly affection that he so desires. And then, obviously, Turbo walks off stage. The thumb is down and the nerd gets killed. Mm. 
And so it's like, wow, this guy's fucked up. You know, he really wants his affection, but he just kills every, you know, person he forces to role play. Yeah. Yeah. Really good scene. Let's go back to Wesley. Samurai. Samurai dude. Mm. Got a big secret. What was oh, yeah. his big secret, Ollie? I, I think it was something like he'd killed someone or, or he'd killed people for Turbo or something He'd like killed that. some people. Was that it? <laughs> Which yeah. is something that happens every day in the yeah. apocalypse. People do that uh, like left and right in the show. Yeah. Kids right. kill other well, kids. That's literally it. He yeah. just killed some anonymous people. He killed someone. Oh, and also he's gay with Turbo. Which is... The, 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 yeah. That's Which kind is, of a blind side. Does that... Does that... Is that like... We knew he was gay. Does that make yeah, sense yeah. in the plot? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Justify, yeah. Okay. It does make sense, yeah. No, they had a relationship before the apocalypse. Mm-hmm. Like, okay. you, you get flashbacks and stuff. Yeah. It does make sense, yeah. Yeah. Um, but he was hiding it because, oh no, Turbo's this horrible, evil, twisted jock king. Right. And he made me kill people. <laughs> yeah, it's like... That happens every day in the show. Okay. <laughs> so... Turbo's kind of real motivation is to get revenge on Josh, not only for Josh evading his grasp, but also Wesley is friends with Josh. And so I think Turbo's jealous of Josh. Yeah, something like They've that. They've got some jealous romantic feud going on. Turbo asks Wesley to kill Josh for him. Wesley's all conflicted, which oh, is... Insane. No, he, he wouldn't be conflicted in this. It's, yeah. It, it, Wesley nearly does kill Josh <laughs> for Turbo. Yeah. Which is not something his character would do in a million years. No. No. Because he's, like, repenting for all of his sins. Mm -hmm. And he's friends with Josh now. And he is so torn up about how he killed some kids one time. (laughs) That now he's like, oh, Turbo asked me to do it. God, I better do it, you know? (laughs) I'm so conflicted. (laughs) Yeah. And and like like I said earlier, Turbo is one of the most mistreated characters in the show. He has the potential to be incredible and just falls flat. So to Mm. finally circle back around... Mm. Turbo has his twisted stage play with his pretend father. And in, like, the next episode onwards, he's back to being kind of a normal, sane person. Yeah. W- totally unexplained. He can, like, almost have total... Not not conversations, but he can, like, sit down with people and, like, write stuff down. He has, like, so- one kissing scene with Wesley where it reveals <laughs> that they were gay together. Right. And, and, and they do it in front of Baron Triumph. They do it on the floor in front of Baron Triumph, <laughs> who was the principal at their school. Why? <laughs> Is that <laughs> unexplained? Why? <laughs> so that Baron Triumph can know about yeah, it and later have some plot point where he talks about it. It's, I don't know. it's a plot device. Okay. And it's shunting it so, through. So this, when he just like suddenly becomes um, lucid, mm. this this dude. Mm. Is this is this explained in any way? Or is no, it just no, like, no, no. So, the, it's just, so the writers mm. just sat there and said, actually... You know, this guy's a little bit too, you know... I think the writers are saying so they just kind of episode, changed yeah. him. Let's yeah. give him a two for this episode and then eight for the next Would one. Would you say this is like an yeah. actual drastic change to his character? Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it's it's probably the most drastic change yeah. to any character. Turbo in the show. was very clearly mm. spiralling down mm. a twisted pit. Right. Yep. And then in a, in a one minute he's there, the next minute he's just the normal kid who's a bit messed up. Because it, it's quite interesting because he it's at the start of the series he's not as insane as he is later on. He goes much further down the insane route. Okay. And then he goes to more lucid than he was at the start of the series. Yeah. Um, and essentially you could argue that the only... You could argue that the reason this happens is because he effectively gets back together with Wesley. Yeah. He like sees him again for the first time in a while. Right. And then they have their incredible, lovely, romantic scene together. And then maybe that calmed him down. What's really unsatisfying about that is that his problems his problems weren't Wesley. His twisted character was because of his dad. Yeah. Wesley uh, kissing him doesn't resolve any of yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. It's that just goes it's away. It's like a band-aid if it's totally is. unexplained. Yeah. It's it's a big problem in the show. Mm. Yeah. It's, and this kind of because our original pitch for this show was that Ollie and I would go away and rewrite the show for how we think it should have gone mm. so I have my main idea kind of comes from Turbo and Baron Triumph mine too my, mine too were based exactly just around those Good. two characters okay I'll be interested to see what you actually mm. so Turbo gets oh. ousted by his own mm-hmm. uh, oh and this is where Sam comes back Sam is Sam is revealed at this point as being still alive Josh's girlfriend oh Sam mm-hmm. is the longest suspenseful plot line which kind of gets forgotten about briefly yeah, in the middle in of that the middle somewhere. it does yeah and then comes back, and it turns out, where was she? She was in the school the entire time with the jocks. 
just hanging what? around. She was like a farmer or something, wasn't she? She was trying to grow food in the apocalypse. Yeah. Uh, a lot of her crops were growing mutated because everything's... Yeah. Despite the fact that they weren't nuclear bombs, everything's irradiated. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So <laughs> and, and it's explained by... She planted some flowers that absorbed all the heavy metals, I think, is, is the plot. Okay. Which I thought was going somewhere else. <laughs> I did... A, what do you mean? How so... They have a flashback to a lesson with Mrs. Crumble. She's telling them about sunflowers and how they're really good and they absorb heavy metals. Yeah. They absorb metals, right? Mm. Oh, yeah. The zombies crave the iron. Eat the sunflower. Eat the sunflowers. Oh, I that thought that's quite where smart, it was going. actually. I didn't think of that. Wait. Sunflowers Wait. supposedly absorb heavy metals. Okay. And all the, zo- all the ghoulies are craving iron. Right. So I was thinking that for food they were going to make sunflower soup mm. or something. Oh, okay. <laughs> but it seemed like they were setting up the sunflowers, yeah, but it just kind of ended up yeah. being a romantic symbol at the end. Yeah, that's it. Anyway, this is where Sam actually is. Yeah. She's been with the jocks mm. the entire time. She and Turbo's right-hand woman, Mona Lisa, realize Turbo's a bit self-destructive, out of control, mm. so they depose him. Yep. They go to Baron Triumph. Hey, we need an authority figure. <laughs> Promise not to eat anyone? Sure, I promise not to eat anyone. Great, be the principal again. He has a fight with Turbo, impales Turbo in the face with an axe or yeah, something. Some, yeah, it's, yeah, in the slices in the corridor, yeah. And mm. then he chucks him in a bin. Okay. Yeah, and they leave him for dead. Yeah. Right. Wesley, boy hero, saves Turbo and attends to his wounds. And, and that's yeah. that from then on. Mm-hmm. That's fine. So Baron Triumph becomes the principal of the school. He reforms. He realises he's made mistakes. He realises that, you know, he doesn't have to eat kids. He needs to take control and kind of lead everyone back from the brink. He gets together all the smart kids and he's like, hey, let's try and figure out the solution to this, which doesn't work, obviously. Yeah. And also he's like, like, where are all the nerds? And he's like, oh, you ate them all. (laughs) Oh, yeah, I did. (laughs) That's quite a good scene. That was funny. (laughs) There's a really funny scene that I like. (laughs) Another one you're thinking of, yeah. They walk into his office (laughs) and it's like, you hear thumping from a closet. You open up the closet door, <laughs> and inside is the one remaining member of the golf team. Oh my god, he's still with alive. one leg and one arm bandaged, yeah. amputated. He's got his golf club, and he's like <laughs> <laughs> hitting golf balls into a mug that's on the floor, and he's clearly high on something. Yeah. That's a good up. scene, yeah. And they're like, oh my god, what happened to your limbs? Mm. And then Principal Burr comes back in the room yeah. with his red smoothie. Oh, he's been chopping off bits of Gary or whatever his name was. Yeah, Larry or Mary. Or Barry. Whichever one it is, yeah. Yeah. Um, So, way he's actually killing them all. Yeah. And now, wait, wait, let me guess. All the kids then find a common enemy once everyone discovers that Principal is actually the true evil and they band together, breaking (laughs) through alliances and... Not even close, mate. Not Not even close. (laughs) It's much more disappointing than that. Really? I think... I thought that was the disappointing option. (laughs) I would, it's okay. It's okay. okay. It's kind of... You suspend your disbelief. Okay. The jocks are kind of cool with it. Yeah. I don't, do they know? They. I think, they, I think it's implied They're cool they with him know. eating it, people. Yeah. As long as it's not them. Presumably. I think they are so devoid of leadership yeah, they that they anyway. value his leadership more than they value the lives of everyone who's dying anyway. Mm. Okay. And so he leads them on in his merry mission to destroy everything. There's a bomb right in the middle of town, I think, that he intends to detonate. Big climactic finish. Mm-hmm. After we talk about the witch. Yeah, the witch is probably one of the more interesting characters in the show. Now, when they start to focus on her, it gets really good for a while. Mm. So she's crazy, right? Mm-hmm. But they start to explain like how she's crazy. Mm-hmm. And she thinks she's on a, a stage production of her own life. And she's having flashbacks to things that may or may not have happened. Like, for instance, she hooks up with Principal Burr. Mm. It's like they're having an affair. But she doesn't actually know whether that happened or not. Because mm. she's so out of it. She doesn't know what's real and what is fake. That's he pushes yeah. her down the stairs mm. oh, at one mean. point. Just before just the bombs before the explosions. Off. Turns out the principal has a war bunker in uh, the school because it's such an old building. And which like is ridiculous a, as well. A war shelter. Uh, yeah. So the bombs go off and he gets in there and is safe. It's kind of glossed over a little bit. She survived just as well as he did. The reason she's crazy is because when he pushed her down the stairs, she hit her head and she's got brain damage. Yeah. So her craziness is not ghoulie craziness. Her craziness is that she's got brain damage. She's actually just, yeah. Yeah. But she does eat eat metal though. 
Yeah, but so does he. Yeah. Oh, yeah, good point. Yeah, of course. So yeah. some of the biochemical stuff got to them, but some of it didn't. Right. But how did, did she come to the bunker with No. It, I think he might have dragged her into the bunker. Oh, do you think? I think it's implied, but it's oh, very right. badly got across, if, okay. if that's the case. Mm. Otherwise, maybe it's just the solid school foundations with its thick walls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Why, why are the other teachers not? Yeah, it's it's a bit it's, it's a bit wishy-washy. Okay, so that... Yeah. Um, I'll give uh, that the, origin story a three the, out of ten. They actually, they actually <laughs> do reveal why the kids are immune to the disease. Okay. In, I think it's episode eight or seven. It's pretty late. It's mm. something like that. And it, it turns out that the, the kind of hand-wavy thing is the HPV vaccine. If you've yeah. had the HPV vaccine, you're immune to the biochemical. There's so many kids that haven't had the HPV, yeah. HPV vaccine, though. That would have been way better. If we'd seen at least like Ooh, yeah. one or two kids that running been around bad. being mm. ghoulies, just completely unexplained, mm. it would leave you guessing as to like, whoa, hold on, it's not just kids. What the hell's going on? It's not yeah, just that. That would have been good. Yeah. And then, it, yeah, and then, instead I'm sure of just some studying the witch the whole time or whatever, instead of the witch being the only focus mm. of little Mary, mm. what's her name, and Angelica, Angelica, Angelica. yeah, you try and figure out why her friend or something is. <laughs> let's hit we're, we're, we're building up the suspense let's cover the end okay and then talk about Sam because I think that's quite a encapsulated thing okay. anyway so we've got the missile we've got the jocks the stage is kind of set for the ending so Josh's band versus the jocks uh, Josh gets together all of the uh, music playing people on his group yeah. loads them up onto a big tour bus gets them to play full volume and to drive at the jocks obviously in order to Law the ghoulies. Law mm. the ghoulies. Right. right okay. yeah. This is one big issue I have with them. They don't care about kids' lives. Josh like has lots of regrets for trying to assassinate Turbo at one point. Uh, yeah, there's there's a lot. Of, he feels like mm. a bad person, and then he leads an army of ghoulies to go kill all the jocks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that doesn't go down. That is very true, actually. Yeah. So then there's a big fight. Eventually. Uh, Josh and his friends make their way back inside the cereal factory where Baron Triumph is. They, like, actually kill him, right? Yeah. Or too. nearly kind of I kill him. Like... And then alien-style <sighs> stuff is swirling around in his belly and then it bursts out and a massive dragon hand weird alien thing yeah. is reaching out. Like Velociraptor style. Right, and, okay. And they have a callback to the very first episode. Josh has got his sword. In the very first episode, there's a funny bit where he tries to chop off a guy's middle finger. And the sword. And he just hits the hand, and then the guy's there, like, screaming for a while. It's funny. <laughs> it's quite good, actually. This time, circular story device. He sees this big alien dragon hand thing, sees the finger, has his sword, manages to chop it off perfectly, and then the dragon hand thing dies. Yeah. Okay. Which I'm guessing is going to be the main plot of season two. Um, so it's actually like a parasite. Something like that, unexplained. But why does chopping its finger off kill it? No, I think is it because it's not like fully born yet? Yeah, I guess it's kind of like an embryo at this point. I guess a parasite would die when its mm. host dies. So yeah. yeah, so that's fine. Right. Whatever. We've stopped Principal Burr. Mm. They go out. The Chinese student helps Angelica read the Chinese instructions on the Chinese missile. And they're like, oh no, it's going to go off anyway. Mm. The bomb is going to explode. There's no way to stop it. Wait, but it's a rocket that hasn't been launched yet. There's still enough fuel left in it. We could blast it up into space and detonate it high above the city so it won't kill anything. <laughs> oh, wait. It's a manual trigger. Someone has to stay behind <laughs> no, to set off the rocket. <laughs> Yeah. Oh no! Okay, so there's one point, there's one thing I want to point out about this. Mm. Throughout the series, you see people driving around remote controlled cars and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And the, like, the esports nerds have got their own technology. They could easily rig up something. Some, to is it just like a button? Yeah. It's a button. So all you need to do is like have a string and like a piece of and over like a candle even or something burns it down. It's just yeah. so it really <sighs> doesn't need anyone. To no, decide. it's a Deus Ex Machina to require someone to stay behind. Yes. Right. So who should do it? Mrs. Crumble volunteers. 
because she's a monster. No, Mrs. Pendle, you, know? you have become a mother figure. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know, Angelica true. prevents her from, oh, don't do it, Mrs. Grumble, mm. I'd rather we all die. I don't know if she says that, but <laughs> there's some false, yeah. really kind of tacky, very badly done tension. Um, but Mrs. Grumble is like, it's okay, I'll just turn into a flock of birds and I'll escape before it even happens, because she's crazy. And then she stays behind, she sets off the rocket, goes into space, explodes above them. And like everyone's crying, oh no, Mrs. Crumble, what a sacrifice. Oh, she was such a good, such a good person in the end. And then the camera pans over and she's there. <laughs> and they're like, Mrs. Crumble, how did you survive? I told you, I just turned into a flock of pigeons. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's not a very good scene, all right? That's the long no, and the short of it. No, this is, this is by far the worst scene that I've heard so but, far. Uh, honestly, the... just, there's too much happening. Yeah. Just like there's, mm-hmm. there's the one, like, you either pick a boss battle or you pick like a giant scary mm. enemy someone has to sacrifice themselves mm. why is there both why why is there that and that and then there's also like the that fact as well that it's a bomb oh, means there's no problems. emotional investment yeah, this yeah. right so okay. that's the story of daybreak well Sam Sam is the last piece of the puzzle mm. okay the big motivation Josh's whole deal mm-hmm. Sam finding this girl who he loved presumably and who he left notes to all over the city there was yeah. she left one for him where are you yep. and from then on he went crazy and he tagged the walls with I am here which even if you remember you wrote that letter doesn't really tell you anything surely it should be I am at this address and yeah. not am Josh <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that would have... I am here sounds more like an existential cry of yeah. meaning rather than Hi, Sam, where are you? Please come find yeah. me at my address. Dear Sam, uh, I'm writing to inform you that I am staying at this address. <laughs> Love Josh. So, what's the deal with Sam? Josh falls wildly for her. She's the first girl he's ever yeah, kind of been with. Uh, he's a virgin, he's never had sex before. So, when it comes up to that, there's like a whole big flashback episode. So, we don't know anything about Sam until this. Mm. This is the okay. big kind of reveal of Josh's true mm. relationship with whoever this Sam person is. They try to have sex. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It doesn't go well because he's so nervous. It's his first time. So he doesn't know stuff, how it's supposed yeah. to work. So on and so forth. Mm. Turns out, Sam is very experienced at all this. Basically, ends up revealing as much of a reveal as it is and mm. isn't, which is the point of contention. Oh, you know, I've slept with like 25 guys. Yeah. Including people like Hoyles, the, the bully from uh, yeah. before... Josh, in his emotional, naive, kind of romantic view of the situation, Mm. is quite appalled by this. Mm -hmm. Oh, he thought they were sharing their first time. Mm. Josh is idealistically, hopelessly romantic. Sam takes it the wrong way and kind of goes on a, uh, are you slut-shaming me? Yeah. Thing. Which is a knee-jerk reaction, which is kind of fine, because it's yeah. probably in her character. I, I agree, yeah. I so she, she's kind of tries to make an example of why, like, women get slut-shamed, but men are heroes. What's mm. all that about? Yeah. Then this pizza delivery guy arrives. Oh, God, this scene. And she... <laughs> Does yeah. she have sex with him? No, but no. she she flirts with him yeah. very heavily. Essentially, yeah, that's what she puts up on and all that stuff. And, and then after that, they kind of actually go back to normal for a bit. Yeah, yeah. Until the thing where, oh, his dad died. Yeah. Oh, I was messing around with you. You know, just go away, leave me alone. She's like, well, why are you taking this out on me? Just, you know, just, you slut, get away from me. Yeah. And so it turns into that. Okay. So the big reveal is that him and Sam broke up before the apocalypse. And even though he's been chasing after her, like, they aren't together. So the, the to boil it right down, the point of contention between them, Josh thinks he loves her. She's overly cynical mm. and disillusioned, disenfranchised with relationships. She knows or thinks he doesn't love her. He just loves the idea of her. And there's all kind of the women objectification thing. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially, he thinks he's a white knight going to save his princess. Even though she's doing fine without him. She's fine without yeah. him. And she doesn't really care. Yeah. <laughs> and she doesn't, she dislikes that. Yeah. That idea that she's a princess who needs saving. In, in a way, he's like, I mean, he's just another guy to her. Right. Yeah. There's nothing particularly special there between them. So they save everyone from Baron Triumph. 
And he goes to Sam and hugs her. And he's like, hey, let's go back to my place. And we can just be together again. And she's like, no. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. What the fuck? <laughs> like, <laughs> we're not together. No. <laughs> so at, which, <laughs> at which point she kind of appoints herself as the head of the jocks. No, not just the head of the jocks. Oh, as the like head of all the kids. The queen. <laughs> yeah. And okay. she, she ends the season as queen of the wasteland, essentially. She uh, declares herself a dictator. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> which... It's funny because actually I'm fine with that. I'm as well, actually. Yeah, I was fine with it. It was. What's really funny about the situation is that the they, the camera like won the final shots mm. in the whole series. It looks at Josh and his friends, and they're all like, "Oh God, what have we done? She's now a dictator. Oh no!" Really, they should be like, "Huh? Yeah, Sam was pretty smart. Yeah, she she's... knows everyone." She's like ties everyone together into one big group. She's definitely the best person for the she, job right she's now. She's the yeah. best possible <laughs> candidate to be a leader. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how the series ends. Yes. Yeah. With her sitting on a throne and Yeah. Turbo's throne and everyone looking well, half the people looking horrified and half the people really happy and cheering. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. What do you think? Um uh, I mean, they they sound like this there's, there's some really interesting concepts mm. in there. Like the idea of um like how kids would handle the wasteland type situation, mm. um, and I guess in one uh, in one sense this is like a one sided conversation because you're telling me largely what's bad about it. Some things that are good about it as well, but mm. um, but I get the distinct impression that the show, this writers, are scared of taking risks and letting plots develop naturally, mm. and rather instead resort to using like a lot of plot devices and a lot of like convenience. Like yeah. plot conveniences to I advance think, the story. I think what they did was had fundamentally too much going on. Yes. This this yeah. the season would have been fine as maybe two or three seasons. Mm. When mm. you say that we told you mostly bad stuff, how about I quickly run through what I think was good? Yeah, yeah. I, there's there's some good stuff in that. Okay. Yeah. Zombies retain their personality to some degree. Mm-hmm. That idea is pretty good. So it, it's good with a with an asterisk in the it's a great idea for the two main characters who are zombies, which is Principal Burr and Miss Crumble. They could have done it more okay. with a few other people and have more of a spectrum of awareness. Yeah. Because that could have created more of a moral issue. Yeah. That would have been quite good, actually, yeah. You know? If they'd done that. Turbo using kids for his role-play family therapy. That Those scenes are some of the best in the whole show, I think. They, Absolutely. They were very, very strong. Mrs. Crumble's mental state being a sitcom yeah. to her. <laughs> that, that she's that an unwilling. Quite funny, actually. That was good. Mm. There was like one episode where it was almost entirely that. Mm. Other good things. I quite liked episode eight, which is the one where it's a long flashback to Sam and Josh's relationship. <sighs> I thought it was okay. I thought it was okay because it tackled it quite concisely opened up a whole load of just social issues and attempted to say something about them. I like, just, oh, slut-shaming women, and like, oh, first-time sex. And I think my biggest of... problem with it is it didn't need to be a whole episode. It could have been a part of an episode, or broken between a, like an actual episode. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think making it the whole flashback one episode, I just wasted time on anything else. I think they could mm. have also, they could have made it shorter mm. and focused only on Josh as a naive child, Sam is cynical and disillusioned. Mm. Focus on that about their relationship, and so have the ro- the idealistic romanticism versus the mm. I've slept with twenty five guys and you can't slip slut shame me. Yeah. <laughs> you know? In fact, now, now you mention it, they could have just taken out the entire pizza scene, the entire yeah. <laughs> makeup scene, and it would have been totally uh, exactly the same. Almost, there would have been no difference. It's a bit bloated. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, then the other good mm. thing. Oh no, that was it. That was my good list. Okay. There, yeah. This, yeah, I, I agree with a lot of those. Do you have anything to add? Um, I think the way, I think the way the factions were displayed was good as well. I think the world building as a whole is fantastic. It's hard for me to think of anything else fiction wise that is as good recently. I could totally imagine myself in the world. Um, it seems like it could actually happen hmm. if you wave away some of the specific characters yeah. and Angelica. choices they make. So, yeah, Angelica so if we one. take away the plot lines and just give you the environment, mm. the occasion, do you think it's... Yeah, it's very good, it's, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's, very it's good. actually it feels good. like It feels fleshed out. To summarise, here's what's really bad and mediocre. Characters do things that those characters wouldn't do. 
mm. cardinal sin number one. Mm. Like, hey, we've got some well-established characters, and now we're going to have them do something that they wouldn't do. <laughs> so that's terrible. Um, the fact that the ghoulies are this kind of enigma, and they have they don't do anything imaginative beyond Principal Burr and Miss Crumble with them. Yeah, they don't actually do that much in the whole show. Mm. There's one scene where Josh throws some blood that like they actually interact with it, but yeah. other than that, that's the only real scene where they are and involved. Otherwise, yeah. the ghoulies are either in the background or they're just trapped in cages and being used as a mm. American Ninja Idol mm. dro- kill cage. Mm. So, do you, does it give you the impression that perhaps the ghoulies aren't as like aren't as dangerous as they might be in the actual situation? Yeah. Like? Or is I suppose that's kind of how you want to run the series. I think, I think it's fine that they're like this. Then mm. so it's, less about it's about mostly the focused on the humans yeah. as opposed I to the zombies. I don't care about the lack of major threat of them. Mm. I care that clearly what's happened to them is more interesting because you've got all these few exceptions, mm. which they could have explored way better yes, with some definitely. other characters. Yeah. Definitely. I think if you had a cast of characters which was two thirds kids, one third adults, mm. rather than. 98% kids and 2% <laughs> yeah. adults, mm. then you could have done some interesting stuff. Sam tried to let Burr eat Barry. Yeah, that was a very weird scene. In the cage with the, I, what was it, whipped cream or something like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Barry, so when they go to Principal Burr and they're like, hey, will you be our leader so long as you don't eat any kids? They sweeten the deal by allowing him to eat one kid. What? Or trying to. And he's totally okay with it. <laughs> the kid is totally fine with being him. <laughs> Barry is the last surviving member of the golf team. Oh, he's the he's golf like, team. hey, the golf team is cursed. I'm on my own. Mm. Just eat me. <laughs> <laughs> Sam tries to kill a kid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and his hand waved away. It's They're fine with it. It's nonsense. And then he eats the kid later on. And, he doesn't, and, she and, get, and she's like pissed off about it. Yeah. <laughs> it's so... It's nonsense. It's That's just... Characters do things that those characters would never yeah. do. Yeah, some would do that. Yeah. Uh, the HPV vaccine was weak. Yeah, very weak. Duh, it's a vaccine. That's why you reacted differently to a biological weapon. Fine with unleashing a horde of zombies on kids, but not on letting one person die at the very end. <laughs> <laughs> All right, should we talk about how to fix it? Yeah. yeah. The biggest issue I had with the show, and I've mentioned this a couple of times before, is that. Turbo and Baron Triumph were horribly mistreated in the show. They they had the potential to be fantastic characters and they just dried up. And I, I've also mentioned this before, but I think the biggest problem was that there's too many plot devices, too many plot points in one season, in 10 episodes, essentially. And the first step I do is make, is I'd pull it out into two or maybe three seasons. I'd have Baron Triumph in the first season be kind of like a monolithic monster behind the scenes taking kids away no reveal at all in season one he's just there he's just a constant threat okay um turbo turbo i feel like they should have gone darker with i i think i think the major rewrite i would have had is moved the asterisks from comedy to horror i think there's a lot of potential to have a lot of horror, horror but with comedy there's a lot of stuff they did which was very twisted hmm I swear Angelica does some really twisted stuff. Yeah, she does. She's like a 10-year-old. She's like a 10-year-old. So they're not afraid to do dark things. Mm. They're just afraid to realise that they're actually really dark Mm. because they painted over with the comedy. If they were daring, they would have painted everything with comedy and then just drop the comedy <laughs> and have like, have Josh with his fourth wall, He's uh, he thinks he's talking to a camera, have him do something really twisted and then realise how fucked up he is. I feel like that's a hard sell to Netflix. <laughs> I don't know, Netflix have done some stuff mm. like that, right? I suppose it's just the audience they're trying to aim for. So so you would stretch it out? I'd stretch it out, I'd have... I'd have I think I'd have Baron Triumph reveal either either right at the end of season one or midway through season two. Uh, So the general plot I'd have is, I think it should be like a traveling around, sort of introducing the world, building the world a lot more, building the connections between characters a lot more. Uh, We can have Turbo. Turbo can be the main big bad in season one. I want Baron Trapp to be there, but in the background. Uh, But Turbo and his relationship with Wesley, I guess you could could work on that more um, because it felt very weak. Wesley should have done something way worse. Yes. 
for Turbo, mm. which would then help with the whole reason he's conflicted about killing Josh at the end. Yeah. If he, like, really loved Turbo, mm. or not even loved, but, like, maybe some sort of Stockholm Syndrome, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think the main thing I would do, mm. rather than taking your approach of stretching it out to give more time to flesh it out, yeah. I would just cut mercilessly really? many things. Get rid of the Chermazons. We didn't. I, they were cool, cool idea, but we didn't even mention them. We've been talking about this for nearly two hours. And, and there was a there was an entire episode with the Chermazons. Why was there an episode with the Chermazons? <laughs> like Angelica sees them as maybe strong female role models. That's it. <laughs> yeah, that's literally their only role is for yeah. Angelica to be accepted. The witch and Angelica join them, mm. and they don't realize the witch is a witch until she licks some blood. Oh. Like just get rid of that completely. Throw out. Eli, the mall, focus only on Wesley, Turbo, Josh, and Sam. Baron Triumph in the background, Turbo the main villain. Mm. Now, the idea I had, the main kind of pitch I would pitch to you, we have here Big Bad Baron Triumph who gets spoiled too early. Mm. We have Turbo who's got daddy issues. Turbo needs a father figure in his oh, life. Oh, God. Are you going to pitch that Baron Triumph Baron becomes... Triumph becomes Turbo's father figure. <laughs> so, they appoint... They... Something... I don't, so, the way that they invited Baron Triumph to be the leader was yeah. really crap, right? Yes. Because, like, hey, you're a cannibal. Uh, please be our leader. <laughs> so, instead of that, have something much darker happen where... Turbo is, like, almost eaten by ghoulies and Baron Triumph captures him or something oh, wow, yeah. and he gets a really twisted affection for Baron Triumph which Baron Triumph exploits to become the puppet master behind Turbo I actually quite like this idea thinking about it so yeah. he doesn't literally get voted in by the kids mm. he, but he's in control okay I think I think that I think we definitely agree that Turbo and Baron Triumph are the big problems with this show um, they were supposed to be the big motivators mm. Sam was a bit of a red herring motivator. Because hmm. like we said, you kind of she kind of just gets forgotten about for half the series. So would would you get rid of Angelica then? Or would she still be in the show? I think Sam could become Angelica. I, I'm, I'm alright with that. Yeah. I think so. Because mm. I like how it introduces Josh. Sam is already an inquisitive scientific mind anyway. Have her assume Angelica's role. And and, and they do they do have quite a lot of crossover in their plot. Like Sam solves the food crisis bit and that should have been like either Angelica's plot point or Sam should have been doing Angelica's research yeah. not having two scientists my question for you is at this point so you're cutting a lot of things out which is good in, in mm. something that's too busy um, but my question is how would you make it like would this would you design this show to be one season because if you don't open any Un- unclosed plot points you don't have anything to work on for next season so what is your what is I, your I would to, to be honest I'm kind of surprised there's going to be a season 2 you want it so to you be would one want season it to be a, like a I think this so. is a fixed story about what mm. if if you had to give a tagline for this is this a fixed story about a zombie apocalypse kids, or about kids attempt to deal with their own society that emerges after an apocalypse and fail horribly because there's no adults wow in so so one's the end uh sam takes charge okay and she's the most mature and intellectual of them all. Hmm. And they all know her and all like her. Okay. So she manages to become a dictator. And it, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. But that's left, left open. open. Okay. But that's like the resolution. They form some sort of society that might work. Hmm. And the only reason they're able to form it is because they try having Baron Triumph. And they realise it doesn't work because of him. I do like this from a, from a plot perspective. But I think it'd be a hard sell for one season. Um... Yeah. But it's the exact same as what they did in one season, just less busy, which was its main flaw. Hmm. But from like a commercial standpoint, I'm not sure they go for it. Do they need to have a second season to leave it open for like I more think money? so. I think they'd want that, yeah. Uh, from from a, from a story writing perspective, I do like it a lot. How about... Wait, actually. this What's the samurai's name? Wesley. 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 Wesley's backstory. Okay. Hmm. What dark kind of backstory do you think you could build on? And wait, second part of this, could you give me a pitch for season two, which revolves around some sort of backstory, which comes dark out. Wesley, yeah, Wesley becomes but, the bad guy. But, no, he doesn't become the bad guy. But, but how? But also, 
Do we want to go out and go get food? Oh, yes, yes, but <laughs> food is nice. Okay, we can keep just, talking about this. No, but last just thing. podcast. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So my last question for you then is: both both of you give me a backstory for Wesley, and I will choose the best. What is the most twisted thing that happened in the show? Um, I think it might be Baron Triumph cutting off Barry's legs and using yeah, them in the probably. Smoothies. Yeah, I think so. Either cool. that or I can't think of anything worse than that. The so here's what I would pitch: mm-hmm. Wesley realizes the Baron Triumph is sane before anyone else. He comes into that knowledge Ooh, somehow. Okay. He's out being a samurai. Mm. He gets captured by Baron Triumph, manages to escape. Sure. But the only way he manages to escape is by doing something for Baron Triumph that involves preparing kids to be eaten. Right. <laughs> That's darker. So That's his, more fitting yeah. of being his big secret. Mm. So this is like his classmates, people he knows. Exactly. People he knows, yeah. Okay. I, think, I think I'd go more along the kind of human route. Um, I, think I'd, I think I'd do something like Wesley is so in love with, uh, with Turbo that something happens maybe on an expedition or something to go get supplies and Turbo is um, on the verge of being killed so Wesley kind of in a last ditch effort to save him like hurls a load of kids out into the street to be the distraction for the ghoulies mm. best by saving Turbo mm. uh, I, I think I, I think I play more on more on the kind of relationship side well that definitely needs bolstering yeah relationship mm. so yeah I could see that Mm. Mm. So it's relationship or self-saving. So yeah, like being... one he's if it's essentially sacrificing for love, and the other he's sacrificing for himself. Oh yeah. yeah. Mm. I, th- I think for that reason I'm going to choose Harvey's because it's the more selfish one. Yeah. Whereas sacrificing for love is like, it almost justified because you're like, mm. delusional, mm. but sacrificing just so that you can get out of that situation. That's. That's deep. That's dark. And I would see some vengeance in that. Well, there you go. Mm. That was Daybreak, a Netflix original, which was kind of good, kind of mediocre, had some great potential, but got ruined. I think next time we'll be looking at something a little bit worse. Uh, Because we both like this show. So uh, (laughs) Overall, for how much we've like lambasted it. Yeah. Mm. It's actually fairly good. All right. Well, given that the conversations we've had today, I will watch it probably. Hmm. Yeah, it's definitely worth watching if you get a chance. Um, it's almost entirely spoiled, but I knew that coming in. So you've had the most <laughs> thorough spoiler you could possibly yeah. have. Uh, it's just ten episodes as well, so it's not too bad to mm-hmm. just binge through mm. in a couple of days. Okay, definitely recommend it if you get a chance. Cool. And there we go. Uh, whoever's listening to this, let us know um, what other shows might be suitable for this kind of style of podcast. Ideally, a very bad one next time. I'm looking mm. to torture Harvey in some way. Either a movie, TV, any kind of Netflix, uh, Amazon Prime, Yahoo Stream, <laughs> Twitch, Disney Plus, IRL. <laughs> oh yeah, Disney Plus, <laughs> when that comes out. But yeah, anyway, thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you all in the next episode. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey, you made it all the way to the end of this rather long video, but you could go just a little bit further. Making this took quite a while. We recorded for a couple of hours and then I edited that down to about an hour and a bit and it took a while to get all the clips and to edit all the clips together. It took some time. So if you enjoyed the video, please consider supporting the channel on patreon.com slash hocgaming. And if you have any ideas for what we should do next, pop a comment down below. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.